All right, let's talk about genes and variation and how it relates to um, evolution. So basically, when we discussed um, ideas of evolution, we I mentioned that genes had to be there and every single population has variations. Okay, so sources of genetic variation. The number one cause of genetic variation is mutations. And we know that mutations can be good or they can be bad. They're just minor changes in the overall genetic material. And they can cause things like dimples or things like sickle cell. Okay, so gene shuffling is another cause of genetic variation. Remember we talked about in meiosis um, that gametes are formed and sperm and egg meet. And the reasons, the principle of segregation, Mendel's law, a segregation and independent assortment say that those genes are free to shuffle with other genes and they're not tied to the law of dominance. All right, crossing over, the major, major, major event that happens during meiosis is a reason that we are different from our parents and different from our brothers and sisters. So we need to think about um, like a deck of a card, decks of cards, where all the genes from the mother and from your father are shuffled before they you become fertilized. So in talking about traits, uh, the number of phenotypes for a given trait depend on how many genes control the trait. So when we talk about multiple alleles, that means that a lot of phenotypes um, are being controlled by a lot of um, a lot of different genes for one trait. Um, a single gene trait versus a polygenic trait. So a single dream, gene trait has very few variations, but a polygenic or a multiple allelic trait has many variations of its outcome. The major example that I talk about is skin color is a polygenic trait, meaning um, if you were to line up the amount of chromosome and um, that the trait is coded for, there's a lot of things that go into skin color. It's not just dark over light and dark takes over. It's assortment of genes and um, they combine in different ways to create different skin colors. So natural selection in its relationship to traits is that um, single gene traits lead to changes in um, the frequencies of that particular allele in a population. So um, basically if there is a single gene trait that is dominant or recessive and the dominant one is favored, then that's what the most of the majority of the population will be. If the recessive gene is favored, then um, you'll see more recessive phenotypes in that population. So effect of color mutations on lizard survival. Basically, a lizard can survive if its background matches the skin color. So a gray... Um, a light gray lizard may not survive in a grassy knoll, but a green lizard would because of that variation for, um, of, of traits. So when we're talking about polygenic traits, um, natural selection is going to be a little more um, complex with these sorts of um, traits. And fitness is most important, so it needs to be more specific to that particular environment, not just one over the other. Okay, so the types of selection that you're going to need to know are directional, stabilizing, and disruptive. Um, these selections happen depending on the type of environment that um, the population is exposed to. Directional selection happens when there's an overall shift uh, in a total in one direction of the overall population. So if you look down here, all right. So we've got number of individuals with phenotype, and then we've got probably the size of the phenotype. Okay. So if you look here, the peak is at 20. If you look at the time pass and selection has occurred, the peak is at 30. So basically that means that whatever phenotype measured at 20 was not favored and the favored phenotype was at 30. So basically the entire population grew and so the majority of the favored phenotype 
was much higher here than in this environment here where it was lower. So basically that yellow is representing the area that was favored the most to cause a total shift in a certain direction. That's why it's called directional selection. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, stabilizing selection happens when individuals near the middle are more fit. Basically, what this does is causes the population to stabilize in the middle, and it allows it to be um, a higher peak that's formed. So here you can see the favored area is at 20. Here, that population has grown, and the other ones have slimmed out it's because that population has um the area where 20 is has been thriving, so that population is going to grow. And disruptive selection basically means that you've got two favored populations. Within the population, you have two opposite phenotypes that are important. That can lead to two peaks, and eventually, if this were to cause one peak and another peak, this could lead to speciation, two species forming that weren't. Um, two separate species in the beginning. So one species actually splitting into two because one side is so small and the other side is so large that they're unable to mate anymore. Okay, so genetic drift. Um, so natural selection is not the only way that some evolution can happen. Genetic drift happens when populations, um, it's, it's almost, it's random, it's through probability. So in lar po large populations, probability is going to predict genetic outcomes. In small populations, laws of probability don't work because the genes are not large. There's not a large population of different alleles. So it says, how does it happen? Um, small populations, individuals carry an allele for a trait um, may leave more offspring or descendants than those who don't have the allele just by chance. And then over time, um, those alleles just become more common. So some other ways that genetic drift can happen is there's a founder effect and the bottleneck effect. So the founder effect um, happened with Huntington's disease in Venezuela. Um, also, the type O in South America, which I think I mentioned in class, and then the Amish um, with microcephaly in Pennsylvania. So basically, the founder effect means that um, a change in the allelic frequencies due to the migration of a small group of um, organisms to a new area. So there was a population of people, a family maybe, that moved to Venezuela, and in that small pocket, a couple of people had Huntington. So basically, if it's a dominant or recessive gene, there's still um, a stronger strain of that particular um, gene or allele in that population, and so that's why it would become more prevalent. Um, if you can see here, it says percent of native populations that has the O blood type. So you can see in Mexico, in southern United States and South America, almost all of South American natives have O blood type, 90 to 100 um, percent. And then as you move up a little further and over, you don't really see that many O blood types. So the bottleneck effect is a little bit different. The bottleneck effect is directly related to some sort of catastrophic event that led to um, a shrink of the population. I like to think of that as like the zombie ap apocalypse theory. So basically you got the original population. It's normal. It's all mixed in. Um, some sort of environmental event happened that reduces the population extremely. Then you have bottleneck survivors. And then... You only have those genes here available um, to reproduce. So then you see the original population has changed dramatically from the resulting population. 
more red than yellow. This is another example of the bottleneck event. So we have um, blue, white, and some yellow dots. Then you've got a bottlenecking event and your surviving population don't have any yellow pop any yellow alleles in that population. That's how an overall change can happen to certain traits. The last thing is speciation. Now speciation is just um, the evolution of a new species and that can happen because of disruptive selection. It also can happen because of geographical um, isolation. Um, so geographical isolation just means that there's a river that runs between a population of, let's say, squirrel or a mountain range that separates um, salamanders on one side from salamanders on another. And then eventually they become two different species because the genes on one side of the mountain are isolated and aren't really mixing with the total population, which is on the other side. All right. Two ideas on how evolution occurs. There's gradual, gradual, gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. So gradualism is when evolution occurs slowly over a long period of time. Um, adaptations increase and numbers steadily over time. And that's Darwin's idea that evolution did not happen overnight. It did not happen within one generation. It happened over many, 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 many millions of years um, to get from one um, species to eventually turn into something else. Then you have punctuated equilibrium, and that is when speciation occurs in rapid bursts followed by periods of no change. So punctuated equilibrium means that new species are appearing, and then um, and then there is no change. And so those are two kind of conflicting ideas about how evolution can occur.